got here a relatively new Blues Junior 3. I mean, it's not new, but it's not that old an app. And it came in. The ticket says, please install Eminence Little uh, Texas Neo Speaker provided. That's no problem. Please install 68K resistor across R51 to cool the bias. Uh, I don't know whether uh, the owner of this amp watches my videos or whether word has gotten out, but I will be glad to cool the bias on these because in stock form, they're truly insane. You can see right here where it says GT Eel 84. The GT is all grayed out. This one's still red. This one's red. Uh, grayed out. This tube has been running really hot. And in fact, this tube has lost vacuum. Now, that may or may not be related to the uh, uh, running hot. It could be that it just hit the magic sp speed bump somewhere or, or a pothole, or it could be just the stress of this tube retainer hitting it. Either way, he also is getting a new pair of Eel 84s. So something hit that tube. It's got a big crack in it. Broken glass. Anyway, let me pull the uh, chassis out of this and uh, swap speakers. There's nothing too complicated about this. Once the uh, speaker is disconnected, uh, you can leave the reverb cables in place if you're careful. There are two screws on the sides, one here, one on the other side and two screws on the top. And what I like to do is lay them back down like this. I have the, I would have removed the Eel 84s anyway, just to make sure they didn't hit the speaker when the chassis comes out. But in this case, I didn't have to because they were already out. Let me uh, take these two top screws out and support the chassis as I do. Sometimes it'll gently fall out, sometimes it wants to really fall out, and sometimes it's wedged in there. And we'll find out. Uh, hopefully the foil won't tear. All right, there are no screws holding this chassis in place, and it does not want to move. That's not really a problem. Uh, I've got the bench underneath it supporting most of it. Maybe just pull down gently. Yeah, it's wedged against the foil. All right, plan B. So it's not, in fact, wedged against the foil. It's that little flap of Tolex right there. So let me push it back. Get this little dose separator, which is kind of useful in time, situations like this most of the time. Let's see if this will do the trick. Just to get the chassis started over that lip without tearing up all the Tolex. It's a tight fit to begin with. And the screws compress everything. And uh, they assemble these things really fast, sometimes before the Tolex glue really sets up and it can, it likes to just grab onto the chassis as it sets a little excess bits of adhesive. All right. I think that should come out without tearing anything at this point. It's still a tight squeeze. Some guys use cabinet spreaders, which is kind of like a reverse clamp. Jaws of life, writ small. What often happens with the Blues Juniors and the hot rods is that when the screw on the side comes and grabs these nuts here and these little metal flanges and pulls them up against the wood, uh, it'll actually pull the flange out into the wood so that the flange is actually at an angle. I'm going to exaggerate with my finger like that instead of being perpendicular. This one's still pretty much perpendicular, but that's one of the places where it will often bind to the inside sides of the cab, and especially on the Hot Rod Deluxes and Blues Deluxes and DeVilles and such, where there's a big piece of foil. That's where the foil likes to tear. And the fix for that, once you do get it out, well, actually, tell you, there's two parts. If you see that's the problem, or you feel that's the problem, and you have the screw installed, go ahead and install the screw almost all the way so it's sticking out about a quarter of an inch outside of the chassis. At that point, using a hammer, give one or two kind of dead blows to the screw. Not a ton of force, but enough that you're going to do something, and it'll often push this flange back to the point where you can get the chassis out without that happening. And at that point, if uh, they need to be done anymore, you can take the, of course, take the screw out. And then you can, you can use a hammer to true it up. Uh, that usually works just fine. 
Uh, if you have uh, any right angle bending tools, feel free to do that. Some guys just use heavy duty pliers, which work, but they do gouge up the, the metal. Not that anyone sees it, but little tech tips for you. All right, at that point on the Blues Juniors and other similar current fenders, they're just held in place by a screw. So we get all four of those screws out. And then we'll find out if the speaker will just lift out of the cabinet or whether it was put in before the black paint set, in which case we may have problems. All right, this one we got lucky. No adherence. So let me put this to the side and get the other speaker ready to go. All right, on this new Eminence Neo Lil Texas, the uh, places where the screws go, there's a little bit of the cone material sticking out. I just take an X-Acto knife, make a pretty good slit in it. I used to worry about cutting them out precisely, you know, just really making nice, neat holes. Uh, I realized that the glue line is on the other side of this, so it doesn't really matter if I do neat little holes or just a slit to get the, the screw through. All right, and the new screw locations, I'm going to push the screws through the cuts I made and line them up. And I'm going to start and finish them by hand because I want to make sure that I'm not at any weird angle and that it's not going to strip uh, the bolts or lock up at all. So I just want to make sure it's kind of free turning in there to begin with. And then I can position the next one. Should be right about there. Push through. Start counterclockwise to feel it engage. And then clockwise just a little bit. I want them to have a little wiggle room while I get them all four lined up. Because if you have any one of these at an angle, as it goes into that threaded insert, it will just mangle everything. If you're lucky, you just have to replace a screw. If you're unlucky, you've got to drill out and replace the insert. Things can go weird. All right, once I get them all started, and I'll tighten them all most of the way by hand like this, crisscrossing, kind of like an X. If I were doing a uh, one with eight, I'd do it more like you tune a snare drum where you kind of go in a star pattern. Because you don't want any one flange to have more pressure on it than the rest of them. And I don't use power tools for this unless I have taken the time to set the torque very carefully. It's much easier to do by hand and get a feel for it. I do each one until I can't turn it anymore with just my index finger and thumb, not using really my wrist or, I mean, my, my wrist is moving, but all the force is coming from my thumb and forefinger. And right, once I get all four so that I can only do it with my thumb and forefinger, uh, then I switch to a little bit of full wrist for another quarter turn. That ought to do it. You want them tight, but not too tight. But I do want to make sure that all these Nuts holding the baffle to the cabinet are tight. I believe those are number sixes. So here's my five sixteenths socket. Reach around on the other side. Notice how much that one turned. These come loose over time as the wood expands and contracts with the temperature changes and humidity changes and such. And then your baffle starts to vibrate when you play. Doesn't matter if you get a shiny new speaker. If the entire baffle is resonating, things will just sound a bit weird. And this is something that I recommend you do if you have a blues or hot rod, etc. When you get it and then recheck it every couple of months, just because wood is weird. All right, reattach the uh, stock speaker cable. When I call the guy to tell him about the U84s, I will suggest upgrading the speaker cable and plug to some good quality Marshall Sound Runner I have, plus a Neutrik or Switchcraft plug, as opposed to this plastic molded cable. Not because I want to make an extra 20 bucks, but because it does make things last a lot longer. But I don't know what his budget is like, and if this is working, at least for now, it's working. Let me put it back together. Actually, I gotta do that resistor tweak for the bias supply first. 
All right, here you can see I have that resistor paralleled with existing R51. That'll cool the bias down without doing any big mods to a relatively inexpensive amplifier. Before I button it up, though, I do want to make sure that the transformer mounting hardware is tight. It rarely is. Oh, and this turns so much. You know, it's the little things that aren't little, really, that get you on these things. I shouldn't be able to turn any of these. Other than maybe a discrepancy in my strength and whoever assembled it. So it shouldn't turn much at all, but that was turning quite a number of times. Let me make sure this ground is tight. And uh, let's check the output transformer mounting as well. And, you know, when things are assembled at what's supposed to be a professional level, it shouldn't matter if it's me, who's about 6'2", 240 pounds, or a linebacker, who's much stronger than I am, or a little old lady from, insert your Southern California city here, because they should be using uh, torque wrenches for things like this. So uh, as you just say, all right, that needs to be at X torque setting, set that on the tool, do it, and it gets done. But they don't. Either that or their torque settings are wrong, or they, all their tools are out of calibration, or it's just a bunch of little old ladies. No offense to little, little old ladies out there, but uh, there are places where torque matters. All right, the input jack is tight, the power switch is, is tight. Time to put this back together. For those who don't know what I mean by a torque setting, this is just a little handheld Ryobi uh, battery-operated uh, hand drill that I like a lot. And it has torque settings, which means that the higher the number, the greater the force it will turn the bit. This is not calibrated. I don't know what eight corresponds to as far as uh, actual PSI or pressure or however it's measured. I don't know what one is, I don't know what four is. I do know that in my experience, four, five is the range I want for tightening a machine screw like this. That is just slightly less tight than I can do by hand and anything else I like to do by hand. But in a big company, where things get really specced out. If you're making a car, you will have a calibrated tool that does the same thing. So the engineer will know that you use setting 17 or whatever, and that's going to correspond to however many pounds per foot that they specify. And all those tools get calibrated on a schedule. And that's what I'm talking about. It's a bit overkill for my needs, but it's nice to have someone willing just to go in there and say, hey, what happens if I do this? So see, I could just barely turn it a little bit past where the drill was. Oh, and while I have it set up to do, these are almost never tight in people's amps. I've done videos on this. Check your handles. Takes a minute to tighten them up. If they get loose, which they almost always are, things get damaged. All right, so it's all back together. What you didn't get to see was I made sure the output jack was tight. It was not. This is a pair of my, these are a pair of my uh, JJ EL84s that I use for testing. I will call the owner and see if he has a brand preference, but I wanted to put some in that I knew worked. Now, when it comes to this uh, kind of rough and ready bias tweak on a Blues Junior, it's simple and it's effective. No, you don't have fine control over what the actual bias is. It's going to be typically between about 55 and 60%, which is a lot better than the 100 to 120% the factory is. Uh, but neither did you have control over the bias on an old Princeton back in the 60s. It's fine as long as you have good tubes and the tubes will run a lot cooler and burn things less. Sorry about moving the camera there. And while I would prefer to have an even cooler bias, if I do that, the plate voltage goes up too much and the 84s can't handle that. So, you know, rock in a hard place. Now I'm testing this little uh, Neo Lil Texas. And it sounds pretty good. Uh, I need to play with some other guitars because I'm using the 335, which is still pretty new to me, but it just doesn't seem to have much low end at all. Thank mm -hmm. you.
So I don't know whether something else is wrong with the amp or if this is the sound uh, this speaker has. So let me power it off for a second and hook up my shop cab instead of the eminence and see what the same settings sound like through a cab and speaker I know well. This Neo just doesn't have a ton of lows, and if I uh, turn the lows way up on the uh, on the amp, the bass is already at eight on this. It's you know about almost two o'clock, which is pretty high. The whole circuit's gonna be woofing, so I'm not sure that this would be my choice. But you know, some guys don't like a lot of low end. It depends on what role the speaker is playing in the band and what role the guitarist is taking. Uh, I'm gonna try this at higher volumes when I'm not using a lav mic, and I'll use some guitars I know better and form a final opinion. One other thing I did in this uh, off-camera while I was doing the bias tweak is I moved these two ribbon cables away from this blue wire, which is one of the primaries on the output transformer. If that wire is too close to these, it can cause hum and oscillation, as I've shown in other videos. But... Um, <laughs> Objectively, the amp is healthy. Objectively, the sound through my cab is what I expect uh, mostly stock blues tuner to sound like. Objectively, the bias is now good. Uh, the filter caps don't seem to have any issues. There's no, been no uh, heat damage to the, uh, to the output tube sockets or anything as can be common when these run too hot. And now it's less likely that there will be. Subjectively, I'm not sure that I like the Lil Texas Neo, at least paired with uh, the Blues Junior, but I will wait to put some real playing time with the rear cover on, which can affect the sound in the low end uh, through some guitars that I, I know better, and have it facing me, not the other way. So this is not a, a perfect test of it here, but it's enough to know that initially I'm a little bit iffy about the speaker. <laughs> But that's all subjective. Mm -hmm.